Hi everyone, welcome back to another flipped lesson. And in this lesson, we're going to talk about incident command and triage, really important stuff for EMS systems and first responders. Here's all the objectives and key terms. Uh, so make sure you go back and know these at the end. If you want to take a screenshot now, that's a good idea. So when we're talking about incident command, right, we're talking about incidents, which we'll talk about in a second. But we need to understand that first responders, different rescue agencies, different government agencies need to work together in an emergency. Uh, to help everybody out that's being affected. And this has gone on for years since there has been professional rescue agencies, since fire departments started and police departments hundreds of years ago. Um, but really only in the past, I'd say 50 years, had uh, organized, structured responses really become key to the fire system, EMS, police, National Guard, uh, and, and anybody else that may respond into an emergency. And Really, the, the biggest leap forward for all this uh, was back in after in 2003, after 9-11, um, when President Bush created NIMS, which is the National Incident Management System. And it's a standardized framework uh, responding to emergencies and situations where there's multiple juris jurisdictions. So basically, uh, different agents, uh, big events, right, where there might be different agencies from all over coming together that don't normally work together, there was a, there was a need or they first responders recognized that we needed a better way for all these agencies to work together. Um, and so it kind of fell under the federal government and it was a way that one of the th many lessons we learned from 9-11 uh, in terms of first responders. And you can see here, this is actually a picture from uh, right outside ground zero after the towers collapsed. This was their one of their makeshift command posts. You can see maps here. You can see chiefs helmets, officers. Um, and it was a lot of one of the biggest things they learned from 9-11 was you had all these agencies responding, FDNY, NYPD, FBI, ATF, Homeland Security, other agencies from outside New York City were coming in. And they realized that, wow, there is no way that for everybody to communicate to each other. Um, and basically one of the towers, one of the twin towers that fell was a, a major, not only was it New York City's emergency command post, uh, it was also a communication center. So communications were down. So um, we really learned a, a ton of lessons from 9-11, and one of which being this overarching theme of how do we get all these agencies uh, to come together and work together so that we have smooth smooth response efforts and we can save the most amount of people um, total. And you can see here, there's just a picture of people from uh, different areas, which we'll talk about part of that incident command structure, which is part of NIMS here, which is the national, right? NIMS is the national and there's different roles. Okay. And it's just important to remember, right? We think about the bad stuff uh, all the time that's caused by people, terrorist attacks, shootings, things like that. But NIMS is also part of uh, natural disasters too, earthquakes, to uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, volcanoes, uh, the wildfires out West. This actually really was first started uh, back in the 1970s in California responding to wildfires, all right? So uh, part of that NIMS, right, is the Incident Command System, which is a method for managing any incident regardless of its cause, size, scope, or complexity. And an incident is anything out of the ordinary day-to-day uh, -day activities of a fire uh, organization, EMS, police, something like that. So it's important to remember we think about ICS incident command as these big giant events, right? 9-11, Boston Marathon, um, things like that, California wildfires. But an, an incident could just be something that maybe you don't deal with every day. If your town has one ambulance, if you live in a small town and only a couple of EMTs and enough to man one or two fire trucks, if you have a two or three car accident or a school bus with multiple patients, right? That is an incident, okay? So this the nice thing about this structure here, uh, and this is the, the basic outline of the incident command structure, uh, is that it can be used for really, really large scale events, those level six events where it's many, many days, many, many agencies, or it can be used for, you know, an event where you have 10 people, okay? We're not gonna go through all of these, all right? But a couple of big ones to point out here in ICS is there obviously has to be somebody in charge, right? An incident commander. That person needs to be identified. And it's important that the incident commander really just is a step back. They're not in there doing anything. They're not helping people. They're not directing, uh, you know, teams. If it's a fire that are fighting fires, they're not in there doing that. If it's a mass casualty incident, they're not in there treating patients, right? The incident commander is all the way back overseeing everything. And there's a couple different sections that fall under them, right? The operations section, the planning section, 
logistics, and finance and administration. So through many, many years of doing this, um, and part of that NIM system that came out, they, they really recognize these four areas as part of incident command, uh, which are key to a successful operation, whether it's a fire, a multi-person accident, uh, or a terrorist attack, natural disaster, anything, right? So the operations section, and you could, you could read through all the different titles here, um, and the incident commander has the ability to make different titles too, depending on the situation, right? But these are the people that are, are literally carrying out the operation. So um, in Boston, right, in the Boston Marathon bombing, right, those operations people were in charge of doing the triage, treating the patients, moving people around, right? We had different task force, different strike teams that did stuff, um, and different supervisors overseeing them. Okay, so the operation is what gets it done. The planning is really, really important for those longer term events, multi-day, multi-week, uh, multi-month incidents where there's lots of resources, right? Because if you think about it, if we have 200 firefighters showing up to a scene, well, what do we need for those firefighters? We need water, we need food, we need shelter, we need relief, we need places for them to go. Lots and lots of planning that go into this. So there's a planning section chief. The next person is a logistics section chief, right? Um, kind of help go along with that planner, right? Going, uh, I, I would say they work together in planning, but figuring out the logistics of how are we actually going to do this, right? How are we going to build stuff out? What buildings are we going to need to use? Where are people going to go? That's the logistics section chief. And then finally, the finance or admin, because everything we do costs money. People need to get paid. People need to get reimbursed. People that are affected need to uh, get support from the government. And you hear all the times about natural disasters, how much it costs. Well, this finance uh, admin person here is really, really key in kind of totaling up costs. All right. So everybody is overseen by the incident commander. You have four different sections down here, areas where things are carried out. And then you see some of these other people that are at the top above these four people that get stuff done. Right. The public information officer is, if you could guess from the title, uh, somebody that speaks to the press. And this is especially during... Uh, incidents where people want information, terrorist attacks, school shootings, things like that. You know, they'll ask anybody, a firefighter, an EMT, a police officer walking around. It's really important that the only people who speaks to the press is a public information officer because you don't want to cause people to have unnecessary fear or anxiety or cause more issues from misinformation, right? Legal officer oversees legal operations. The liaison officer is going to be a liaison between local authorities, bigger, uh, bigger agencies, the safety officer is a really, really, really key uh, person because they oversee the safety of everything, of everything that's going on out of all the four sections. And the safety officer, officer has the authority to actually halt all operations if they see something bad happening, something that's going to cause harm to one of the rescuers or somebody in the operation, right? We need to remember, as always, the first most important thing is our safety as responders. So that's the general incident command system structure. And like I said, the key thing to remember about this is we use this whenever there's any type of incident, but it really plays down into even our everyday, right? We talk about it as an as a incident when there's something big, but we can use this in our everyday, right? When there's a fire uh, or even, you know, the fire department's responding to a car accident, someone is going to be the incident commander, usually the fire officer that's there, or if there's a chief or deputy chief, right? They're going to have command of the situation and oversee everything. And this structure really works even on those everyday stuff. It's great to know who's doing what. Everybody has a role. All right. So part of that, and I mean, we could talk about NIMS and ICS. You could do plenty of courses on it. I guess that's something I should say as well is if you want to do the actual courses, you could do a couple of them online. There's many different levels, um, everything from introduction to hazmat and operation, all types of courses. And you can actually get those online on, on the NIMS uh, website under FEMA, right? It's under the Federal Emergency Management Agency. It's a federal program. So check that out if you want to take more of them. Um, they're free and you can do them online. Okay. But a little bit more small scale, local scale in the everyday, right? A, a key part of uh, incident command and using our resources, especially people from outside of our agency, is something called mutual aid, right? So mutual aid is an agreement between usually fire departments to help each other across jurisdictional boundaries, all right? And this means that when a town, and we'll stick with Burlington, for example, right? When they have a bunch of calls and they're out and there's nobody left, well, what if somebody calls 911 because, you know, their, their loved one's having, is in cardiac arrest? 
Does that mean they have to wait until Burlington's cleared up from all its other incidents going on? Well, no, this is the idea of mutual aid is that surrounding communities will help each other out. Okay. Uh, and actually I found that I just, this was a tweet from last week. Um, you can see Burlington fire tweeted. Thanks to all our mutual aid partners who assisted Burlington. So th there was a house fire. I believe this is on, it was on, I guess it must've been the 15th of September. Um, Burlington, everybody was working a house fire. I forget where, I think everybody ended up okay. And they put the fire out pretty quick. So all, everybody was there, ambulance, fire trucks, um, so you have Woburn Fire, Engine 4, on a medical with Belrica uh, EMS ambulance at Shaw's, right? And Woburn was on coverage for Burlington as a mutual aid. So since everybody in Burlington was busy with the house fire, Woburn Engine 4 was on mutual aid. They got a call and went, and Belrica came too for uh, ALS, I'm assuming, for an ambulance. So that just shows right here. It happens all the time when a department or a town are busy is busy. We help each other out to make sure that everybody is... Uh, safe and we can respond to our communities as quickly and effectively as possible. So mutual aid, departments helping each other out. And I guess a big part of that too is our dispatchers, right? The dispatchers are the, the heroes behind the computer and behind the radio that are kind of getting everything where they need to go. So that's mutual aid, all right? So this is a really important thing here, and this is going to take up a chunk of this lesson, is something called triage, all right? Maybe you've heard of triage before, um, but we usually do, so we do this on every uh, incident I we're on, we're say, right? Because you never, yes, you get some information from dispatch. Oh, somebody's having chest pain and we're going there. But you never actually know how many patients there are and what's going on until you get there. Um, and you need to think about it. You could have more than one patient, right? In a car accident, uh, just in a single vehicle accident, you could have five, six, seven patients. So that's definitely more than one ambulance can handle. All right. Uh, and we have what we can designate certain incidents as MCIs or mass casualty incident. And that's an incident involving two or more patients um, or basically where the number of patients exceed the immediate resources. So if you work in a community where you have three, four, five, six ambulances, you know, you could cover a lot of patients. In Burlington, I, they have two ambulances right now, I believe. Um, so if you get a couple of patients, right, that could be considered a mass casualty incident where it's more than just Burlington can handle. And I put some of the more, right, with MCIs, we don't always think about the little ones. We think about the big ones. And I'm sure everybody knows this picture here from Boston Marathon bombing. Um, this picture here is actually from Sandy Hook in Connecticut, uh, which was a terrible, terrible school shooting. Uh, but again, a mass casualty incident. And this was a more recent one. I don't know if you know this. This was a, in Beirut. There was a giant explosion. explosion. Uh, I believe it was like a firework factory or, or not fireworks. Uh, chemicals were being stored. I think it was like fertilizers and stuff like that. Huge, huge explosion. So not only did you have tons of building collapses and fires, you had tons of people injured. Um, so these are all real MCIs, right? Multi -ca multiple casualty incidents. And it's really important. And this is one of the really tougher things that hopefully you never have to do in, in as a first responder. Uh, but you need to be prepared. Is You need to be prepared to triage, right? Um, you need to understand that in a certain incidence, not everybody may be able to uh, survive, okay? And not everybody may be able to get to for us to save them. It's, it's a tough call to make, but we need to be prepared. You know, if you have 100 patients um, and you could really help 80 of them survive, if you focus on the 80 that need it and 20 pass away, uh, is that better than trying to help the three people that are really, really critically injured and probably aren't going to make it, but now other people suffer? So it's that, that close, uh, you know, it's a real difficult process, but there's a way, an organized way to do it. And we call that triage, right? It's a pro process of prioritizing patients for treatment and transport based on certain criteria. So, and, and just to talk about triage, right now we're, in this lesson, we're talking about it in terms of a mass casualty incident. But it's, like I said before, it's actually important to remember that we triage patients on every call we go on, right? If I have a, a two car collision, and somebody's not breathing and they got ejected from the car and the other guy's screaming, oh, my, my wrist hurts, my wrist hurts. You know, right there is a pretty clear triage. The guy who's not breathing and got ejected out of the car is probably a more serious patient. So triaging is a good skill to have whenever we see multiple patients on every call. But in this sense, we're gonna talk about it uh, on an MCI level, a mass casualty incident, okay? So there used to be four, there's there's actually five now, and this picture doesn't um, get into it, but a couple slides later, right? So there's four, oops, excuse me. There's four common triage casualties, okay? And I'm sure you could guess the 
the pictures here, right? But red, and we actually classify them as colors, right? Because it's much easier if we have a an area, let's say there's 20 patients all over the ground um, after like an explosion. It's much easier to identify people based on color than whatever the wording of the sign that we put around them is, okay? So our red patients are our immediate, right? Are the ones that are critically injured, okay? If they are not uh, attended to very quickly, they're going to die, all right? Things like chest wounds, shock, open fractures, burns, bleeding, uh, really, really serious stuff would be the immediate. The yellows are the delayed, which are kind of in the middle, all right? They could end up going into the red category, but they're stable at the moment. They're not gonna die relatively quickly. So abdominal wounds, um, central nervous system, brain head injuries, right? Eye injuries, uh, broken bones, okay? Maybe they can't get up and walk because both their legs are broken, but they're not, um, they're not bleeding out, okay? That would be your yellows. And then your greens are your minimal, right? Um, minor burns, minor fracture, laceration. We often call these the walking wounded and the reason we call them the walking not the walking dead the walking wounded uh is because normally these people can walk they may be hurt they may be injured uh but they can walk and that's something that's going to be key for us to use and we'll talk about that in a minute and then finally so you can actually see i have uh like two categories here so depending on who you talk to there may be four maybe five uh, but we have the expectant category okay which i would actually put as gray is expectant which means your injuries are so bad that you are not going to survive it based on um, this being an mci incident um so an example would be a head injury where uh brain matter is coming out right there's nothing you can really do to fix that and if you have so many other patients you might just have to let that person be and then black is when they're obviously dead so they have no pulse they're not breathing um, normally we would do CPR in an MCI situation. We would not, they would be considered black and dead. Um, other signs like obvious signs of death, like decapitation, right? There's nothing anybody can do to fix that. So they would be black. Um, so those are your basic five categories there. Uh, and the, the thing to remember here with triage, right? And mass casualty incidents is that there are many, there's a few different ways to handle mass casualty incidents, and different what we call triage systems, okay? The, but the thing to remember is that they're all basically based on this same idea, that you have four to five categories, and you're going to treat people different based on where they are. And not only treat, you're going to transport differently. And, and it goes, but they both have the same idea, right? The red patients you immediately need to get out of there as fast as we can. The greens, they may not even actually go to the hospital, believe it or not. So we have that, that spectrum of how we're treating and transporting patients. So the two things to know here, right, is there's two, the two biggest types of triage systems would be SALT and SMART, okay? And I believe, and it depends on who you ask on what they do. I believe the state of Massachusetts wants us to use the uh, SMART uh, triage system, okay, or START, and, but I, they basically have to do the same thing. They're both acronyms, okay? So a four-step process. We'll start with SALT. Sort, assess, life-saving interventions, and treatment and transport, okay? And pretty similar here on the other on the other one is too. So, and just looking at that, right, before we go through the steps here, we actually have what are called MCI kits. So every ambulance has one, fire trucks have them, um, and it's actually this big giant kit. Sometimes they come in a big box like this where we have all types of stuff to go over an MCI. Um, most importantly is we have these cards and on the next slide, they're a little bit bigger, which each patient gets a card and based on where they fall in the category, black, green, red, yellow, they are going to get triaged a certain color and it's going to say that on their card. All right. Also in these things, we have all types of different things. We have these big, these are actually giant tarps that we would lay on the ground. So any red people, any immediate injuries would go on the red tarp. Anybody who's green, that walking wounded, will actually say, hey, if you can hear my voice, walk towards me. And anybody that can get up and walk is going to walk over here to the green. All right. And that means that they're walking wounded. Okay. Whereas the yellows and reds, we're going to have to sort out and move them to that area. Uh, one thing about the greens, though, the walking wounded, is it's important to remember that just because somebody walks over, it doesn't mean that they are necessarily a, a green. Right. Um, they may walk over, but have of such a severe head injury that within two minutes, they drop and go unconscious, okay? So you need to have somebody at every triage station 
in these three colors, evaluating people when they're there. All right. And saying, oh, you're actually a yellow. I'm going to move you up. Or same thing in yellow. You're a green. I'm going to move you down. I'm going to move you up to a red. Okay. And to talk about that, you actually see here also in these uh, kits are different colored vests. All right. And if you go look way back at the first slide, um, you'll see everybody was sitting around a table and they had vests on for TRIA, uh, for incident command, right? So everybody in a mass casualty incident or any type of major incident is going to be wearing a vest that says who they are. So it's easy to point out, oh, you're the incident commander. Oh, you're the safety officer. All right. And for us in terms of triage, and this is usually going to be an EMT or whoever shows up in the first ambulance is actually the triage officer, right? You'll have a vest that says triage. And we can see this woman here. She's the triage officer for this um, incident here. And basically all she's gonna do actually, she's not gonna treat anybody. She's gonna walk around with these tags and triage everybody. She's gonna find out what's going on. Oh, uh, you know, you have two broken legs, but you're conscious, you're not bleeding, you're a yellow. And she's gonna put a yellow tag on them. Oh, you are not breathing, you don't have a pulse, you're dead. You're, bl you're black, you're expectant. Oh, you have an amputated leg, let me put a tourniquet on, you're gonna be red, okay? So the triage officer does that. Um, and that kind of speaks to both these systems here, right? Is So the assess, the life-saving interventions, doesn't mean we're gonna do everything to treat these patients. We're gonna do things like insert an, or, an, uh, an oral airway, right? To hold the airway open. Uh, we're gonna put a tourniquet on. We're gonna put a chest seal in if they have a sucking chest wound. So basic, basic life-saving stuff is what the triage officer does. And then eventually, when more EMTs show up, more firefighters, uh, first responders, whoever, right, they are going to do the treatment and transport. So we'll have them stationed at the different areas. They're going to start to treat the injuries and transport, starting with the red immediate patients. Okay. So it, it's really, uh, it's actually, it's kind of, it's scary, but practicing triage and mass casualty incidents is something we do at least once a year in EMS uh, within our agencies and fire departments, because it's really important to have these skills because God forbid there were ever an emergency where you had, you know, a mass casualty incident. We want to be prepared to be able to do it and not have to think about it. So it's important to practice setting up that incident command, practice having an incident commander, practice having a triage officer, practice triaging patients, and then having everybody else, the other first responders who are going to, come in and treat and transport based on what the triage officer said, um, come in and do that. And it's really important to practice that so we know our skills, okay? Uh, let's see here, oh, excuse me. So just a little bit more of that. Um, so these are those cards blown up here and uh, they're pretty cool. You could, they have some room for vitals, they have room for respirations, patient's information. And these bottom pieces here are actually uh, ripoffs, okay? so. If the person's green, you put this over them like a necklace and they walk over to the green. Um, somebody's yellow, maybe they can't move, they have those broken legs. You're gonna rip the green off from the bottom. So you would just tear this green off and then it would be yellow. Same thing, if they're red, you tear the yellow and green off and they'd be red. And if they're deceased, you tear everything off, just leave it on them, they are deceased. And you can see here some of the different areas, right? So red, no peripheral pulses like in your hands or feet, don't obey commands, having trouble breathing, major bleeding. Gray, like we said, mo most likely going to die, so they would be deceased, right, or expectant. Brain matter showing, 90% burns, major life-threatening stuff we can't fix. Yellow, broken bones, burns, and then green, that walking wounded. All right, and obviously black is deceased. So those are your, your basic areas. And oops, we already had that. And that's it. All right, so I know that was a lot uh, in this video, but really, really important topic to be able to talk about triage and incident command. Uh, and how that all works. Because as first responders, we need to be prepared to know how the incident command system works, know how something like NIMS works on a national or multi-state agency level, so that when we have these emergencies, we could jump right in, we could be assigned our role, oh, we're the triage officer, we're the safety officer, we're the treatment team, we're on strike force one, or task force one, or a strike team, and we know how to fall in. So really important stuff. Make sure you go back and know any of the vocab words we went over the main objectives and be prepared for class so stay tuned make sure you like and subscribe and we'll see you on the next one